Hello, everybody. I think we'll get started. Uh, my name is Ellen Goldring, and I'm the Executive Associate Dean at Peabody College. And on behalf of Peabody College and the Peabody Research Office, we welcome you to our research conversation this afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague and our speaker today, Maury Nation. Um, Maury is gonna talk about the relationships between urban schools and urban communities. Maury is the Bob Innes Chair and Professor of Human and Organizational Development at Peabody College of Education and Human Development. Professor Nation's research focuses on the prevention of violence among school-aged children, understanding community and neighborhood qualities and characteristics that promote youth development <clears throat> and developing programs and practices that promote positive school climate and equity for students of color. He has been principal investigator on numerous large scale grant from sponsors such as the Centers for Disease Control, the National Institute of Justice and the Health Resources and Services Administration. He is a pro prolific scholar and writer with many influential publications, including What Works in Prevention, Principles of Effective Prevention Programs that was published in 2003 in the American Psychologist, a seminal piece that has been referenced and cited over hundreds of times. He is an active member of community and professional associations in such roles as serving on the board of directors for domestic violence intervention here, center here in Nashville. He's a member of the Scientific Advisory Panel on Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America in Washington, DC, and the Scientific Advisory Panel of Dissemination and Implementation Planning and Youth Violence and Child Maltreatment Prevention in the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. We are recording this session. And after Dr. Nation's talk, there'll be time for questions and answers, and we will try to monitor the chat and facilitate that. So please um, add your questions to the chat. And please welcome me in uh, joining Professor Nation for this interesting talk. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. And I, I want to start I, just by saying that I know that I have more than I'm going to have time to talk about. So I'm, I'm going to uh, go through as much as I can, and I'm looking forward to being able to have a conversation with you all about, um, about this work. Uh, before I start, I definitely want to acknowledge uh, those who have been uh, uh, involved in this work and want to give a particular uh, shout out to uh, Metro Nashville Public Schools. And um, they have just been uh, very deeply uh, engaged and, and just a vibrant partner in helping to, to pull this work together. I also want to acknowledge our funders, uh, in this case, uh, the National Institute of Justice. And of course, uh, to uh, be clear that uh, what's presented here is not the, um, the perspective of the Department of Justice. Um, so I want to give you an overview of what I'm hoping to talk about. Uh, the, the first part of the presentation is really focused on uh, the why. Why is it that we focus on urban education and how we define uh, the, the construct of interest? And then uh, next, I want to focus on some of the work here locally in Nashville, uh, in particular focusing on the, the Nashville Longitudinal Study of Youth Safety and Well-Being that I think uh, illustrates some of the issues that are uh, affecting urban school districts and, and some of the complexities in understanding how uh, communities, um, community context impacts what happens in schools. And then uh, finally, I want to share uh, some of the data, uh, and uh, it's certainly a work in prog process uh, or progress, but um, I want to share both what we are starting to see as well as the things that we have on our agenda over the next uh, several years, actually. Uh, so with that, I, I will start by giving a shout out to uh, one of our colleagues, Rich Milner, uh, 
because I, I, I think about when we use the term urban education, for so many times it has been coded language for uh, essentially Black students and uh, having a very individual student identification um, uh, with, with this term. And I, I appreciate the work that Dr. Milner and his, his co collaborators have done in trying to expand the ways in which we think about that so that it is much more of a, a, a sociological concept uh, uh, tying into things like the size of the community uh, as well as the resources that are surrounding the community. So um, uh, Rich and his team developed this, this taxonomy of, of urban schools, uh, uh, intensive, emergent, and characteristic. And it really varies on the size of the community. So we're talking about urban intensive uh, districts, which um, are typically communities that are a million uh, folks or more. Uh, and then you have emergent uh, districts that are, are essentially mid-sized cities. And then you have these characteristic uh, districts that are schools that have many of the, the kind of demographic characteristics that we have come to associate with urban districts, but are not, uh, or urban schools, but are not necessarily located in urban areas. Um, one of the things that, that um, uh, Milner and, and et al. notes is that there are several characteristics, particularly student characteristics, that goes along with this designation. So you tend to have an overrepresentation uh, or a significant representation of low uh, socioeconomic status, um, a, a broad racial diversity, and uh, um, uh, a significant population of English language learners. You also have this issue of uh, resources and how they are distributed. So um, you, you often see schools struggling with um, kind of limited access to resources, um, often being supported by federal programs like Title I. And um, what I, I draw attention to this in part because I think the urban intensive districts are really um, have a special set of problems that, that, that they face. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, uh, Milner et al. really uh, talked about uh, this, this particular characteristic because once a district has gotten to be urban intensive, it faces not only these issues, which are, are largely descriptive, but I like to think of it as a, a, a sociological issue that, that uh, many of these districts begin to face. Uh, those come out in the form of community structure. So I'm thinking particularly uh, the geography of um, those urban uh, intensive schools and districts. And I, I note here uh, Millican v. Bradley, a, a court case um, that I mean, arguably is behind maybe Brown is probably one of the most important um, uh, uh, education decisions by, by the Supreme Court. It essentially uh, allowed um, de facto um, segregation by not requiring people to take into account segregation that happens across district lines. So what you started to see happen in many of the, 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 the large urban areas is what I refer to as this, this idea of a symbiotic district, that is a high performing district that's often placed somewhere really um, adjacent to the urban district. And we can see multiple examples of this. Uh, certainly, uh, you think of places like uh, DC, where you have the Northern Virginia districts. Um, you have uh, here in Nashville, uh, Williamson County's district, uh, Memphis with the Germantown district. Um, these are, are uh, again, places, ways in which the population repositions itself often replicating the segregation that was designed to be undone by the, 
by the Brown uh, decision. Um, you also see this then reflected in the residential segregation. That is essentially people move as opposed as opposed to segregating their schools, they segregated their, their residential neighborhoods and, uh, and then created schools that, that um, essentially community schools that drew on the, the local neighborhoods. Um, you also see these districts af affected by um, uh, gentrification and housing insecurity. So part of what you start to see is um, either um, uh, significant problems with homelessness and, and students not able to, to have secure housing. You also see displacement of students, uh, often from um, uh, either uh, the low-income neighborhoods that are then being uh, uh, resettled and increased by, um, um, essentially by new people who are entering the community and displacing people because of the, uh, the increase in property values. Now, what that does then is lead to another level of, um, of uh, kind of demographic sifting, uh, for lack of a better term. So you start to see this divergence between the demographics of the community and the demographics of the schools and the school districts. Uh, and what goes along with that is often a, a divestment in, in public education. That is that, that people who have the most resources and often the most power are no longer actively engaged with the district. And then finally, uh, in urban intensive districts, you almost see universally these public narratives that start to emerge about the district that reinforce many of these other processes that we talked about. So uh, urban schools are violent, urban, uh, the parents of urban students don't care, and uh, these are just a sample of, of many of those types of, um, of narratives that start to emerge. Now, I raise this, um, and, Lastly, uh, again, a shout out to Milner and, and um, colleagues because they also know that, that what happens outside of school matters. And uh, we know that through a variety of different types of studies that, that the, the, ge the geographic context matters, that is uh, differences across neighborhoods, the socio-political context matters, um, we also have seen that environmental context matters uh, in the form of the, the types of social and biological toxins that, that have been associated with uh, school outcomes. Now, what we know much less about is the mechanisms by which those, um, th these contextual factors impact what happens in schools. And I raise that because I, I think those of us who are interested in, in urban schools, this is a particularly important um, uh, uh, kind of dimension because yeah, we're, we're definitely worried and, and interested in schools as a, uh, our education as a justice issue, that is that there's equity within our schools. But we also, uh, many of us, and I count myself among them, sees education as a tool for social justice as well. So ideally we are able to leverage what happens in schools to be able to, to mitigate some of the, the, the social injustices that are happening in, in our broader community. So I, 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 I think one of the things that we are acknowledging in urban education is that there's important missing pieces around understanding the mechanisms that connect uh, communities, uh, urban communities and urban schools. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about how this then applies to Metro Nashville public schools. And I want to uh, kind of go back a little bit to um, 2014 when we first started some of this work. And what you start to see is this, this significant changes in the district um, that have 
started, I mean, depending on how far you want to go back, we can, we can go back to the mid 60s where we started to see shifts in the, the student population. I would say that especially in the, in the uh, mid 90s, that's, that process started to accelerate. So now you have uh, the majority of the, the students who are experiencing some type of economic disadvantage. Um, you have a significant portion of the, the students in the, or uh, school age students in Davidson County attending, not attending um, the public school district. And in 2014, we had um, more than 14,000 suspensions and expulsions. And when we look at the rates of those um, uh, suspensions by, by race, uh, we see that black students were bearing a, a significantly uh, heavier burden of those suspensions than, than their white peers. Now, um, along with that, we have these dramatic kind of demographic uh, uh, changes that were occurring since the mid 90s, as I mentioned. So what you see is, um, uh, in, in many ways, uh, it's hard not to be struck by these changes um, in, in essentially 15 years, um, uh, I'm sorry, 25 years. Uh, you have these type of, of shifts in the, 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 the types of students that the, the district is serving. And what you essentially see is that the, these are happening incrementally across years such that even as the district tries to adjust to the previous change, uh, the new changes are such that they're, they're always, uh, in many ways, having to, to struggle with being a step behind. Now, one of the things that I think we're observing in this data is that, that uh, Metro Nashville is in many ways developing into this urban intensive district. That is, now we now have a, a a student population that's majority minority. And that's not true of, our, uh, of Davidson County. Uh, there is also a, a, a kind of unequal distribution of resources. And, and we can talk about this in the broad sense between uh, say uh, districts, but we can also see it within schools. That is, if you walk into um, uh, say a, uh, a, a Belmont, um, a Belmont Waverly Elementary School. That's going to look a bit different than, uh, say, a uh, Haynes um, uh, Middle School or a, a, a Stratford High School, and uh, and those have every, many things to do with the types of students that are being served there. Um, the other thing that we see in the, uh, the, the district data is these outflows of particular types of families, um, particularly the uh, families that are middle class, um, um, much more uh, or disproportionately likely to be white families uh, moving to suburban districts. And this is happening, especially once we get to the middle and high school uh, uh, level. So if you look at the distribution of Metro Nashville students, they are disproportionately located in elementary schools, which tend to be much more focused on community, um, um, homogenized communities, as opposed to the high schools that have um, that would draw across many and more diverse communities. Um, and what we see as a result of this is that in, in many ways, the residential segregation is then replicated in, in the schools, um, in the district schools. Now, I raise all of this because uh, in many ways, this, this has, um, the district has, relatively uh, limited ability to change this dynamic internally. I mean, we can certainly talk about uh, policies like busing and, and such that might even out 
some of the, the demographic differences. However, um, there is a sociological and social structural problem that, uh, that, that is clearly affecting how schools are structured and what happens within schools that isn't necessarily directly under the, the district's control. Now, I raise that to, to then uh, kind of turn our attention toward a, um, a particular example that emerged from uh, Metro Nashville Public Schools. Uh, in 2014, um, the Annenberg um, Institute for School Reform funded a, uh, an initiative called uh, Positive and Safe Schools Advancing Greater Equity Passage uh, as a way of specifically trying to address the issue of disciplinary disparities that I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, so this was uh, started uh, as a, uh, uh, intentionally as a school and community partnership to be um, for both schools and community partners to be in conversation with each other about how, about the sources of these inequities and the ways in which we might develop um, uh, policies that might reduce these inequities. So uh, one of the things I was privileged to be a part of it, and uh, it was uh, a broad coalition of, of stakeholders, including uh, district personnel at, 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 at many different levels, uh, youth serving organizations, police, uh, the mayor's office, and, and many of the, the metro departments, parents. Uh, and I would note that, that these aren't mutually exclusive categories and that many of the people who were in these other categories were also parents of MMBS students. And of course, uh, juvenile courts who, who um, uh, Dr. Uh, Judge Callaway and her team had been incredibly supportive in trying to figure out how to make Nashville better for, uh, and Nashville schools better for uh, uh, our young people. Um, I will say one of the things that I think uh, hasn't been told about the passage committee is some of the intentionality about really wanting to address race as, as and, and um, the social structures affecting the district. Uh, there were some hard conversations, including conversations where uh, outside facilitators were brought in to, uh, to, to talk about, um, uh, kind of the, the historical dynamics as well as what's happening currently. And one of the things I appreciate about having these stakeholders there is that it prevented the type of scapegoating that often goes on uh, in these conversations because uh, teachers and, and principals and parents were, were present, they could push back against narratives that really started to scapegoat any one particular group as being the sole source of the issues. Now, what we came out of uh, in, in these conversations was this understanding that it is, it is complex, to say the least. I mean, there are some school contributors, um, and we see those in the form of uh, both implicit and explicit bias. That is, there is some very blatant and open racism that occurs, but I think we find that that um, much more common and concerning are the ways in which we're not even aware that we uh, perhaps bias um, in our responses to to students from from different racial and ethnic and, and economic uh, socioeconomic classes. Um, there is definitely policies that were identified, disciplinary policies, practices that, that were identified as contributing. One of the things that we also noted, and this is, this is one of the first places where you really start to see the, the intersection of community is between school variation uh, accounted for much of the inequities and the, the rates of, um, of suspensions. And what I mean by that is that a lot of times when we think about uh, these inequities, we think about 
um, a particular school where you know the the um, the faculty or the teacher is is punishing um, a say a black student at much more frequent rates than a white student, and that happened uh, and was happening in some of the schools. However, in in many of those schools, the rates were so low, the overall um, uh, suspension rates were really, really low. So that that wasn't the, the major source of the inequity. Actually, what, what was really driving the inequity is that we have segregated schools and we have some schools that are serving mostly black students who had higher suspension rates than those, those schools that were serving mostly white students. Um, so, uh, I, again, I think we start to see this, this, this intersection with our neighborhood and our community structure. Now, uh, we also recognize that there were insufficient social and emotional supports uh, that, that um, were perhaps differentially affecting some schools and students. Now, Second piece of this, though, was that, and I, I think the passage committee was intentional about this, is making sure that, that we also think about that broader context. So um, there was the acknowledgement that the neighborhoods aren't equal. And in fact, one of the, the real disadvantages when we start to, to talk about inequity is that so much of it gets, uh, directed towards schools because schools have the best, the, the most complete data set as it relates to you. But if we start to look at, at other types of data, and if we had access to those types of data, we would probably see very similar types of inequities across multiple systems. So we know that there's uh, inequities in the, the resources and how they're distributed across Nashville. Um, we also see that there's some real uh, systemic uh, way, systemic ways in which students are being marginalized, both in the for, uh, in the forms of the schools that they are attending, and then and the perceptions of the neighborhoods within which they live. And then we also know that that the the toxins, and I refer to those both in in terms of uh, social and uh, in um, and biological toxins aren't equally distributed as well. So um, this particular uh, committee actually uh, developed a set of interventions uh, that was focused on doing different, engaging with the, the district in a way that would reduce the number of disciplinary infractions but also hopefully reduce these inequities. And these included things like uh, in, uh, cleaning up the disciplinary codes. Uh, back in 2014, the, the most common uh, source uh, code that associated with a suspension was uh, conduct prejudicial to good order, which um, it, as you can imagine, isn't something that is very clear in terms of exactly what a student might have done to warrant a suspension. So uh, removing some of those uh, subjective codes, rewriting the handbook, making it uh, much more student-centric, um, uh, increasing restorative responses, including the, the implementation of restorative practices, um, implementing in implicit bias trainings, um, and also just kind of being much more intentional about the conditions upon which um, uh, students might be um, eligible to, to receive a suspension. Now, fortunately for, for us uh, here at the, uh, at the university, and I think also for the passage, the passage work, uh, the National Institute of Justice also released an RFA at the time of, of, of this that um, uh, really asked for uh, proposals that would focus on how to reduce inequities and promote safety, including things like um, student discipline and safety within um, 
uh, the community, youth safety within the community. So we were fortunate to receive uh, it's a $5 million um, five-year uh, grant that would allow us to collect information and to begin to answer some of these questions. Uh, so what you see, uh, uh, our, our scientific goals were to actually develop this longitudinal data set that would um, uh, allow us to look at the developmental trajectories of multiple cohorts of students uh, and how those intersected with factors um, that are issues that were happening within schools as well as those uh, that were happening within the neighborhoods. Um, we also intentionally built into the proposal this, this idea that we would support uh, local initiatives. So Passage, um, the Youth Violence Task Force from the mayor's office and, and multiple other initiatives that, that have been and are ongoing. Now, the data sources, um, I could spend a lot of time talking about these and I, uh, much more time than I have. What I will say is, and I will go through these relatively quickly, is that um, much of the last several years have been trying to, to triangulate a whole variety of data sources that would allow us to answer these questions. So uh, the major data sources are, are um, uh, the, uh, the student administrative data and survey data from uh, the district, as well as uh, data from a variety of community contacts. And one of the things that we proposed was to find specific ways to hear directly from young people through a, a youth mapping process, kind of how they understood the community and the, the things that they saw as strengths and assets and the things that they saw as problems. So um, to uh, give you a sense of what we have been pulling together. Uh, administrative data includes all the things that you might imagine and some of the things that you probably wouldn't, um, including uh, things like uh, certainly housing and mobility um, and uh, achievement, uh, discipline and structured in a variety of different ways and, and attendance. Um, we have uh, a neighborhood uh, well-being survey that uh, kind of uh, assessed things like how young people were um, uh, positioned after school, what kinds of supports they were, they were, uh, uh, or activities they were engaging in after school, um, the, the degree to which they felt connected both to their neighborhoods and to, to caring adults. Uh, social and emotional uh, competencies, um, their perception of the, the peers, their peers and peer behaviors and all kinds of neighborhood supports and, and resources. Um, school climate, you now uh, as I scroll through these, you can get a sense of the, the scope of the, the things that we were trying to assess. Um, Neighborhood contextual data, we wanted to also get a variety of ways of understanding how young people were positioned within their community. So uh, we looked at things like the United Way 211 database that has various types of supports uh, and, and resources. Uh, the Hub Nashville data where uh, people are able to call and report uh, concerns and, and uh, get those concerns addressed. Uh, we've been working with uh, the Tennessee Department of Health to look at hospital discharge data because we also know that there are health implications uh, for uh, the ways in which we're distributed uh, geographically and that those also have implications for what happens in schools, uh, both direct implications in terms of the health of, of students, but also uh, and indirectly by what is happening to their parents and caregivers. Um, we have uh, census data, both decennial census data, so, so the kind of classic data that we get every 10 years. The problem with that data in this case is that Nashville hardly looks like it did 10 years ago. So we're also using the American Community Survey data uh, 
which gives much more proximal uh, information about many of the same characteristics uh, for the last five years. Um, and then uh, city planning data that, uh, that kind of uh, documents both how land is being used, what kinds of structures are on each parcel, uh, the values of those parcels and, and the degree to which those parcels are being uh, modified or improved over the course of time. Um, we uh, wanted to get a sense of, of violence, especially given that this was focused on, on safety. Uh, we wanted to, to get a sense of, of how um, uh, the exposure to gun violence. So we looked at uh, gun violence archive data uh, from 2014 on. Um, there's also uh, police and crime data uh, looking at a variety of different characteristics, including uh, calls for service and, and stops, uh, all the uh, various types of incidents and the characteristics both of the victims and the, the perpetrators. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, we will uh, have been able to work with our partners at the Nashville Civic Design Center and at the Oasis Center to be able to, uh, to work directly with young folks to, to get their assessments of the, their neighborhoods as well as the places that they go and, and find either as resources or as, as problems. So um, lastly, I will uh, speed up here a little bit. Um, you know, I wanna give you a sense of the scope of what we have been uh, working with. And what I can't do in this talk is to tell you uh, how much effort has gone into the, the preparing of these data sets and the, the issues and addressing issues of privacy and, and, um, uh, and, set, and security. Uh, the district set a high bar, uh, which uh, included uh, multiple consultations with uh, the US DOE uh, privacy and technical assistance team to make sure that we were doing our due diligence to, to, um, to protect the identities of students and such that no one is able to be, uh, no personally identifiable information is, is um, able to be triangulated uh, through this. Uh, uh, and to really be able to identify any student, one ha has to know some already significant amounts of private information to be able to use this data to triangulate. Uh, identifying students. Um, so we have uh, well over a million administrative records that we're, we're uh, cleaning and, and, and pulling together. Uh, in addition to that, the uh, uh, over 80,000 uh, neighborhood well-being surveys. And these are, uh, for many of the students, these are longitudinal. So we're able to see how things may have changed over time. Uh, uh, there's also school climate data, both at the student and the teacher level. Um, similarly, with the crime data, we're looking at over a, a million incidents, um, we're right, right around a million. And then when we start to get into offender and, and victim characteristics, we, we go over a million in those. Um, so I, I say all of this to say, that for those of you who have heard me talk before about uh, you know, hoping that data, that we can present data, this is the reason why we have, um, it has taken uh, as long as it has, is because of the sheer amount of data that, that we're trying to make sure it's clean and uh, it's geocoded so that we can, um, uh, we can use it as it was originally intended. Now, um, and then finally, I, I can't say enough about the, the, the activities of our, our community partners, both uh, the Oasis Center and the Civic Design Center, uh, working with uh, more than 400 kids to do these assessments of a variety of different communities and, and, and places within Nashville. 
uh, that uh, have, have provided support to young people. Now, uh, real quickly, I'll take a few minutes just to tell you some of the things that we're finding. Um, so this is, this is uh, I think, some good news. Um, if you look at the number of uh, suspensions, out of school suspensions over the course of the, the, um, the last several years, since 2014 and the start of passage, what you see is uh, a significant decrease from over, um, uh, over 14,000 uh, out of school suspensions to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, almost uh, around 5,000 in 2019. And I'll, I'll focus on 2019 because that is the last year for which we have uh, data that we're really confident in uh, because of COVID and and um, and some of the the changes in in person schooling that happened in the subsequent years. Um, so very, uh, I I think we can all agree that there's some substantial changes. The problem that I think we're confronted by is that those inequities are still there, uh, and. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that, that I, I, I believe is going to be an ongoing piece for us as a community is to figure out, even in addition to the types of things that, that we've done, how then do we undo those enduring inequities? Similarly, we, we've seen in school suspensions, uh, we didn't see the same type of uh, decline, but um, one of the concerns with the decrease in out-of-school suspensions is that it would actually be made up for in in-school suspensions, and we've not seen that in the data um, uh, uh, to this point. Um, now, one of the things that I that we're also starting to do is to look at um, some of the community data, and, and as I said, this is. This, these are things that we are just now, even in the last week or so, being able to work with these data sets. And what you see here is um, uh, the, the number of gun violence related incidents uh, that have happened in Nashville uh, starting uh, in 2014 as an incomplete year uh, in the sense that that was the year that the archive started. Uh, but what you start to see, especially when we start to look at specific impacts on young people, is that uh, anywhere from 10, uh, um, uh, from uh, 20 or, or more percent of the, the uh, events in, in a given year are affecting young people. And it's hard to imagine that those aren't also them having impacts, both direct impacts, certainly for those who are directly affected, but also indirect impacts on, on students who, um, who are peers and are going to school with uh, young folks or living in neighborhoods uh, that uh, these events are occurring. Um, <clears throat> what we've done, and just in some very kind of global analysis so far, uh, we know that 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 black and low income students uh, are experiencing different kinds of neighborhoods than uh, um, uh, white students. Um, we also know that um, the uh, students, particularly those who are um, low income and uh, are, are having particular difficulty as it relates to some of the structural issues that happen in, in Nashville. That is, if you have a car, Nashville is much more easily navigated as a young person than if you don't. And, and I think that is one of those things that is, is correlated again with SES and with race and with geography. Um, uh, concerns about safety are also uh, correlated with uh, race and geography and, and SES. Um, 
We also see uh, inequities in the access to caring adults. This is um, particularly as it relates to age. Uh, older kids uh, indicate that they're, they're, they have less positive relationships with uh, adults outside of the, the home um, and, and outside of school. Um, we also see that uh, as, as we've started to look at multiple variables in, in combination, um, we're also seeing that um, students who live in neighborhoods that are less safe and less cohesive and have fewer assets are also the ones who have the least mobility to access uh, um, assets in other parts of the city. So it is the proverbial, the, the, the rich or those who are resourced get more resource while those who have less resources uh, tend, to, um, tend to be even more isolated. Um, and then finally, I'll, I'll mention that um, in, in the, the work with, uh, with young people and their mapping, uh, the Civic Design Center in particular has focused on, on uh, having young people identify the types of, of design changes that they feel are important. And uh, transportation is, uh, has been at the top, community resources, food justice, affordable housing and green spaces are again the things that young people themselves are identifying as, as important dimensions of community that are affecting their well-being. Now, uh, what's next? Um, what I would say <clears throat> is that uh, we're still, as I mentioned, just starting to scratch the surface here. We're still geocoding data. So I wasn't able to, uh, to give you examples of the distribution of these uh, across the geography. And one of the things that we know is that there's some, some inequitable um, uh, inequities in the ways in which many of these resources are distributed. Um, so uh, part of our goal is to start to begin to look at, at some of those inequities that we know exist and to look at the impacts that those might have on student outcomes. So access to resources. Resources being a variety of things, everything from, from uh, having access to green spaces and parks and, and um, grocery stores uh, to uh, stable housing uh, and the, the impacts of things like gentrification, uh, the, the increase in um, uh, community structural change and the increase in property values and how that might um, affect students who, both students who are new to neighborhoods, but also those who have been uh, long residents of those neighborhoods. Um, there is um, another uh, thing that we have been discussing is uh, the, the relative contribution of things like SEL competencies and student outcomes. I mean, um, one of our, our partners uh, at the district did a, a fantastic uh, a dissertation, uh, Krista Davis, uh, that, that actually did some of the initial analysis on this question. And one of the things that I think is surprising is that SEL competencies were not uh, as strongly related to academic growth as we thought they, they would be. So part of the question is why is our SEL competency serving the, the role that we think they do? Are, are there other dimensions of the experience, uh, uh, student experience that SEL might be particularly important? And then uh, certainly the, uh, looking at the, the the impact of various types of school practices, including uh, restorative practices, which was really ramped up over the course of the period uh, of, of the study. Um, Trauma-informed supports also uh, ramped up over the course of the study, as well as uh, met the, uh, many of the, the, much of the work of NASA and the after-school programming. Um, 
We're also interested in identifying what's working. I, I appreciate, again, our partners at the district, uh, uh, Tina Stenson and others who, who also recognize that there are many, many, many things that are working well and students who are being able to be successful. And it's important that we figure out what is it about their environments and their support systems that are allowing them to, to have that experience. And then finally, we are interested in and will be engaging with, um, with you all, uh, both uh, here in the, the Peabody community as well as in the broader Nashville community around specific questions uh, in leveraging this data, both quantitative and qualitative, that will allow us to understand, to make sense of some of what we're seeing in the data and to, to think about Way, specific ways in which we might advocate for change. Now, um, I will stop there. Um, <laughs> there is, um, yeah, there's a lot more that I could talk about, but I'll stop there and I will uh, open it up for questions. So Maury, to facilitate the questions, maybe I'll read them because it's hard <laughs> for so many people, if that's okay. Yeah. Okay, so one question we received um, is, did available employment make the list of student wants? So, um, you know, one of the things that, that I, um, that there are a couple of different things that I think are, are going to be, uh, ultimately, that I think we'll be able to speak to. One of the sources of our data, uh, for the, the youth mapping data was the Opportunity Now uh, program that has been sponsored by the, the, uh, the city uh, for uh, summer programs, essentially a summer internship. So uh, we know that uh, there, there were questions that were raised about opportunities um, and that those are differentially, this, like so many other things are differentially distributed um, across students. Um, we have not gotten to the point where we can say specifically, these are the things that they raise related to employment. And one of the things that we'll also be able to have a sense of though is uh, who is doing, who's working after school? I mean, because uh, you know, one of the things that we also know is that um, uh, work after school isn't universally good or universally bad, but we do know that it does make a difference. Um, and it depends on the type of work that a person's doing and, um, and uh, the, the context in which that work is happening. So. My hope is that we will be able to answer uh, many questions about the opportunity and access uh, to the workforce, uh, both before they graduate and their perspectives on um, what might happen after they graduate, but we're, we're not quite there yet. Great, so there's a number of um, questions and um, we'll try to get through as many as we can. So one question asked about the in-school and out-of-school drop of suspension rates and whether you have any um, conjectures or hypothesis, hypotheses about what explains that, including does the reduction reflect more of a change in um, teacher or principal um, reaction to students or interactions with students or was there policy changes or actual improvement in student dispositions? So, you know, I think, I think it's hard to argue that, the, that some of the policy work didn't make a difference. I mean, like I said, you know, if you think about some of the subjective, and, and we've seen this in the literature, not just here, but, uh, uh, you know, nationally, subjective uh, disciplinary codes are, are easy targets for abuse or for pushing out students for whom one has a, a, a problem. And I think removing some of those and, and also um, I think there was uh, certainly an element of, of uh, accountability. And I, I 
hesitate to use that as the primary word, but certainly watching what is happening and making sure that people understand that that you know putting a kid out won't go without at least some notice uh, it made a difference. Um, now I think one of the things, and, and these are some of the things that I think we're hoping to be able to untangle, is that you know also during this period um, there was a, 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 a a significant ramp up of SEL um, supports. Uh, so Kyla Kringle and her team over at uh, Metro uh, implemented several uh, tier one interventions, uh, including uh, SEL foundations, uh, PBIS. Uh, so there's there are multiple things that might be playing into uh, to some of these outcomes. And I think we have the, the kind of power and data that, that would actually allow us to at least unpack some of those, um, uh, the contributions, the differential contributions of, of some of those policies. Great, that's, that's really insightful. There were a number of questions asking about your um, assessment of your sense about the extent to which the Nashville experience is similar to other cities, for example, Austin, especially cities that are showing now widespread growth, um, large influx of new residents, changing in housing patterns, things like that. A couple of people asked about that. So, you know, one of the things, and one of the reasons why this work has been particularly important to me is, is that I, I don't think we have to see what has happened in some of the real long-term urban and dis, uh, intensive districts happen here. Um, you know, Alston is a, a, uh, an interesting example uh, and an analog to uh, Nashville. Um, and what I would say is that um, I don't know that they have, a, a, in fact, I recently looked at their data I don't know that they have had the same type of outflow that that we that they have had outflow from their uh, the um, the independent district there, uh, but I don't know that they've had as much of that as we have, and I think it's going to be critical. Uh, you know, I, I my own belief is that we have a window here uh, in, in Nashville. Because change is happening so quickly, we have a, a chance to um, to think about and perhaps um, be um, purposeful about the type of community that we want to have and the type of school district that we want to have. Uh, because we are in the process of change, um, whereas I think for many of the of uh, these traditional urban intensive districts. The patterns have been set for so long that it is hard to imagine uh, a city that is different from the way that it is now. Um, and the, you know that's one of the reasons why I presented that data from 1993 to 2018 is that mid, I, can, I can imagine that there are some people even in this um, uh, in the, uh, listening to this presentation who were in metro schools in the mid 90s and know that the district was a different place and functioned differently than it, and it, in the context of the community than it does now. And the, the last thing I will say, because I didn't make this clear as I was talking about it, is that I don't want this to come off as we've got to keep um, white families in metro schools. We've got to go and try to chase white families. Um, what I am trying to say is that um, a district is the product of its community. And, and whether or not one sends one's kids to a, um, a district, it doesn't uh, release us from the responsibility of investing in, the, in our public institutions, that common good. Uh, and uh, so, you know, whether or not um, our demographics change, 
I do think it is incumbent upon us to think about the investment uh, that we make in the district uh, differently uh, as a community than we have. On that incredibly uh, important and I find very uplifting note, um, I wanna thank you on behalf of everyone who participated and especially um, as your colleague, we really appreciate this important work that we know is um, just making such a difference in our community. So thank you very much. And thank you everyone for participating and um, feel free to email Dr. Nathan with questions that we didn't get to. I know I'll be happy to interact with you. Thanks everybody. Bye.